Home. Where is home? Home is a feeling. It's being together. Home is an open table. Home is love, unconditional and everlasting. No reservations, no caveats. This is home. Come in. Welcome to worship at First Congregational Church of Greenwich and open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ. It is so good to be with you all in body and in spirit to worship our God this morning. We invite you to center yourselves into this moment to put aside anything that happened before right now and to let yourselves enter into an attitude of prayer and praise and worship of our God. Let us center our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our spirits in worship as we listen to our prelude this morning offered to us by our minister of music, Craig. Let us worship our God together.
Will you please join your hearts, your bodies, and your spirits with me in this gathering prayer? Let us pray. When we are blinded by anger, you pour out your love for all to see. When we wonder what tomorrow will bring, you call us to trust in you. When sadness fills our lives, you plant gardens in our hearts. God of Easter, touch us with your grace. You show us your hands so we may reach out to mend the broken. You show us your feet so we may walk with those the world passes by. You show us your face so we may know what our sisters and brothers look like. Risen Christ, touch us with your compassion. You open our eyes so we may see God's love. Open our minds so we may welcome God's word. Open our lips so we may be God's witnesses. Spirit of hope, touch us with your peace. God in community, holy in one, open us to your presence as we gather together in this time of worship. Amen. Our story for all ages is a, piece, is a piece called The Word Collector. So for those children at home or children at heart, we invite you to gather around the TV. And for those of you who are worshiping with us in person, you will see uh, this story on the monitors in the meeting house. So let this time, let this story bring us closer together and closer to our God. The Word Collector, The Word Collector, by Peter Hamilton Reynolds. Collectors collect things. Some people collect stamps. Some people collect coins. Others collect rocks. Some collect art. Some collect bugs. Others collect baseball cards. Some collect comic books. And Jerome, what did he collect? Wonder. Jerome collected words. He collected words he heard. Certain words caught his attention. My trip to Peru was perfectly pleasant. Peru. He collected words he saw. Certain words jumped out at him. Willow. Willow. He collected words he read. Certain words popped off the page. Emerald. Emerald. Short and sweet words. Spark. Bloom. Drift. Dream. Two syllable treats. Treasure. Whisper. Candid. Glimmer. Hover and multi-syllable words that sounded like little songs. Guacamole. Kaleidoscope. Wonderful. Geometry. Symphony. There were words he did not know the meaning of at first, but they were marvelous to say. Aromatic. Vociferous. Effervescent. There were words whose sounds were perfectly suited to their meaning. Molasses. Torrential. Tyrannosaurus rex. Smudge. Bellow. Jerome filled his scrapbooks with more and Azure. more of his Army. favorite Army. words. Brilliant. Blissful. Timber. Lore. Jerome's collections grew. Potential. He began Lore. organizing them. Everlasting. Dreamy. Science. Dreams. Sad. Action, Ascend. poetic, Palermo, soul. One day, while sure. transporting them, electric, Jerome Cosmic. slipped Cosmic. and his words went flying. Possible. Beyond applause, tyranny, liberty, passion. As he began to pick them up, lost, he noticed dream. 
His collections had become jumbled. Royal harmony, turmeric. Big words Infinite next to little words. Cloak. Sad words Ooh. next to dreamy words. Chocolate cloud star. Jerome began stringing words together. Whisper. Symphony. Electric. Peace. Words he had not imagined being side by side. Favor. Dreams. Cascading. Stars. He used his words to write poems. He used his poems to make songs. They moved. They delighted. Some of his simplest words were his most powerful. I understand. I'm sorry. Thank you. You matter. Jerome eagerly collected more and more of his favorite words. Vision. The more words he knew, the more clearly he could share with the world what he was thinking, Hugs. feeling, Love. and dreaming. Harmony. Empathy. One breezy afternoon, Jerome climbed the highest hill, pulling a wagon packed with his word collection. Bohemian. Molecule. Bungalow. Brilliance. He smiled as he emptied his collection of words into the wind. Quest. Symphony. Savior. Blue. He saw Unity. children in the valley Hollow. below. Glow. Bravery. Scurrying about. Christine. Collecting Affinity. words from the breeze. Redolent. Zeal. Culture. Global. Tintinabulation. Jerome had no words to describe how happy that made him. Reading from the first letter of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he is revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Thank you, Carr. Our first in-person reader in over a year. How about that? Our, uh, yeah, wonderful. Our anthem this morning is a piece called River in Judea. It will be, we will be led by our quartet and Craig on the piano, and this is a piece by John Levitt. Again, may this time of worship bring us all closer together and closer to our God. Sweet. 
Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you. We come now to that time in our worship service where I encourage those of you watching at home and even those of you in the meeting house today to remind you at some point to like, subscribe, share, ring the bell, comment, and share this worship service. Share it with your friends, your neighbors, or anyone you think could benefit from this message today. Our second lesson this morning, it comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. Listen now for God's word to you. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Let us pray. God of restoration and redemption, open our hearts and our minds to your presence with us. Help us to see as you see and encourage us to embrace the fullness of our humanity so that we may find the goodness that lies at the heart of this creation. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. In the life of the early Christian church, long after the disciples who spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus had lived and died, but before Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire and was spread exponentially across the globe, there were a number of scholars and theologians who tried to make sense of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. One idea which grew from those early thinkers and eventually became the dominant lens from which people viewed Jesus' death and resurrection in particular was the idea of atonement. And this concept became so fundamental to the Christian story and movement that it still, to this day, is the fundamental lens through which many Christians view the life of Jesus. So what do we mean when we say atonement? Well, like most things theological, right, this can get pretty deep pretty fast. And many volumes can and have been written about several different theories of atonement. And because I don't think you came today or are tuning in online to hear a synopsis of the seven different theories of atonement and their impact on the life of the church, Because that's not why you're here. I'll do my best to roll them all together and give you an overly simplistic outline of atonement theory, which I am confident would make my early Christian history professor cringe. So the basic idea is this. God created human beings, the book of Genesis. And we, human beings, are fundamentally flawed and sinful creatures who made a holy mess of this world. That's the rest of the Bible. And so according to, to those early scholars, that's a problem. And in order to fix the problem, 
God sent Jesus to atone for the many ways that we human beings have made a mess of this world. Right? Jesus lived and died to make peace with God, to fix the error of our ways. And for countless Christians ac across the course of history and even into today, the Jesus story has been boiled down to whether or not we believe in the proper ways, of course, that Jesus was able to fix our problem to atone for our sinful ways. And if we believe, affirm, and confess that Jesus did fix the problem, that he was the Savior, then we are in, we are good, we are saved, and when we die, we'll be okay. And without a doubt in my mind, I am sure that two weeks ago on Easter Sunday, Thousands of preachers and teachers across this country and around the world, they framed the story of Jesus' death and resurrection from this point of view. Atonement. The idea that Jesus came to fix a fundamental flaw with humanity. That's one lens. Right? So, of course... There's an alternative lens. There's an alternative point of view, which I find to be slightly more hopeful, grounded, and tangible. An alternative perspective informed by the scriptures and based on the word incarnation. A word that I think Jerome, our word collector from the earlier story, would like to have in his collection. So the root of the word incarnation is carne, and carne means flesh. So incarnation quite simply means in the flesh. And when we talk about incarnation in this place, and from a theological perspective, we're talking about when the divine, God, and the human, Jesus, were in the same place at the same time, sharing one body. Now that statement, right, that definition of the term incarnation, that's not something that those early church theologians or many Christian proponents of atonement theory today would disagree with. And I don't doubt at all that it was and is fundamental to their understanding of the Jesus story, that God was both human, or that Jesus was both human and divine. But the incarnation, the incarnation, it's more than a mere statement of fact or belief amongst a litany of other beliefs that we, beliefs that we Christians have. Incarnation at its core, it's deeper. It's a declaration that this world is our home, that these bodies, our flesh and our bones, they are our home, and our home is good. Incarnation is a resounding affirmation of what we've known to be true since the dawn of time, of something that is woven into the fabric of our being and is part of the human story. This creation, it is good. We human beings who were created in the image of God, our bodies, our physical bodies, they are good and it is good to be human. This little blue marble that we live on, floating in the expanse of this universe, it's our home. And the divine, the creator of it all, chose to dwell with us in our home, to experience it all, to see what it means to be human. Not to save us from ourselves or to fix a fundamental flaw, and not to offer us an escape from this life into the, world, into the one that comes. But God dwelled with us to invite us, to lead us and guide us into the fullness of our humanity, to help us uncover and live into the goodness that dwells deep within us all. God dwelled with us so that we too can see that this life and everything we do, experience, and are is a gift, a wonderful, sacred, and holy gift. 
for centuries in the Christian tradition, this incarnational perspective, this affirmation of creation and our physical bodies, it's been overlooked. And it was overlooked because so much emphasis was placed on the spirit and the soul. And our bodies and the physical realm, they were devalued and considered a hindrance, an obstacle to obtaining our place and our peace in the life to come. But this was not the case with Jesus. Right? In every story that we have of him visiting the disciples after he died and was brought back to life, he was physically present with them. And in our story today, he invited them to touch his hands and his feet, to see that it was truly him in the flesh. And then standing before them, Jesus did something that on the surface, it seemed kind of ridiculous and inconsequential, but it was anything but. He asked them if they had any food. Like my boys looking for a snack five minutes after they finished dinner, Jesus was hungry. Jesus Christ, the risen Messiah, the one who conquered death, he was famished. How strange, how common, how completely human to be hungry. And that's exactly the point. That is exactly why the author put that little detail in there that seemingly inconsequential detail. You see, in his resurrected form, Jesus was fully human, not a ghost or a spirit, not some product of the disciples' imagination or some new heavenly form. Jesus came back embodied. And in doing so, in coming back in that way, he proclaimed again that this is home and this creation is home. And our home is good. Jesus came back and he affirmed what God announced at the end of every day of creation in the book of Genesis. This is good. This is very good. Now, as humans who experience this world and interact in meaningful ways with one another, we know and we see that in many ways we do fall short. And we've made a mess of things, and we do things to ourselves and our neighbors that, quite honestly, are not good. That's obvious. We see it all around. But we, collectively and individually, we are more than the toxic and abusive things we do to destroy this creation and the peace that God intends for this world. The incarnation the lens through which God wants us to see the world. It encourages us to embrace the fullness of our humanity, our brokenness and everything in between. God wants us to embrace the fullness of our bodies. Because when we do, when we come to see that our physicality, our materiality is not something to be denied or to be ashamed of, but that it is something to be embraced, Then we can see the deeper truth which God has woven into our human story. That we are good. That you are good. And that this whole creation, it is good. And God God is far more interested in us embracing that, that goodness right alongside with God. God is more interested in us going along with him to restore and redeem this world in the here and now. God longs for us to embrace our humanity, to see the depth and holiness of who we are and what we do in this world so that we can use our gifts, our talents, our passions, and our energy to make this world a better place for all. Incarnation is about a God who, in the words of Eugene Peterson, took on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Moved into the neighborhood to repair it, to restore it, to work with us to bring the peace so many of us think can only be achieved after we die. But God wants that in the here and now. 
So let us embrace the fullness of our humanity, the gift of our bodies and the gift of this creation. Let us embrace all of what it means to be human in this world so that way we can recognize that God is truly with us and together we can restore and repair this world. Let us embrace the story of incarnation, this alternate way of seeing the Jesus story, because the story of incarnation, of repairing and restoring this world together, it's God's story, and it's our story, and it is good. Amen. Make wide the way and straight the path, God with us. He comes in mercy, not in wrath, God with us. Behold an ancient mystery, God stepping into history. Hail the incarnate deity, God with us. Goodwill to men and peace on earth, God with us. He comes to us by humble birth, God with us. Dressed alike in flesh and bone, He comes to make His Father known. His Spirit says we're not alone, God with us, God with us. Because we fell, Yeshua HaMashiach, Emmanuel, God with us. It was always meant to be God with us, with you, with me. Innocent as a newborn child, God with us, the souls of sinners reconciled, God with us. From Bethlehem to Calvary, He comes to set the captives free, that every grave might empty be. God with us, God with us, what a story to tell. Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel, the lame will dance and the blind will see. God with us, with you, with me. Not by merit do we proclaim. He is fully God and fully man. Blessed be his name. But the eternal one has surely kept his vow to be God with us. God and trim the tree God with us a holiday with a mongrel pedigree God with us but at the heart of why we're here the morning after midnight clear reverence replaces fear God with us God with us our hearts compel our worship of the living God Emmanuel May His Spirit give open eyes to see God with us, with you, with me God with us, with you, with me God with us Would you join your hearts with mine in an attitude of prayer? Holy Jesus, Savior, God with us, Emmanuel, 
God incarnate, God in the flesh. Jesus, you are all of these things. You are both fully divine and fully human. And that is good news for us. For you know all that it is to be us. You know what it's like to be human. The joys, the laughter, the love, the friendship, the connections, the community. And Jesus, you know what it's like to hurt, to feel physical, emotional, mental pain. You experienced grief. You experienced hardship. You experienced challenges and anger. Jesus, you know what it's like to be us. And you call us and show us and give us an example of how we can be in this world. You show us what are God's ways for us, ways that heal, that transform, that repair, that build up beloved community. Jesus, we remember that God created the entire world and saw that it was good, which means holy. So we thank you, Jesus, that you show us what else is good, that we are good, that we are holy, that our bodies are in all shapes and sizes and forms, they are holy. We thank you that you show us that communities and families and friends, no matter what kind of relationship they might be, when they are at the core loving, they are holy. We thank you, Jesus. And we pray that we would live into those holy ways. That we would remember that you came to show us the way, the truth, and the life that God seeks to offer us abundantly. And that through that lens, we would seek ourselves to be repairers and healers and transformers of this world like you were. And Jesus, we now know that you have no hands or feet except ours. That we are your body now. And we are the one body of Christ collectively together as the church. So let us live into the fullness of our humanity, all that it is to be human. Let us not shy away from any of it and realize that all of it is good. And even the parts that are not satisfying, that are unfortunate, the parts that let us down and disappoint, that they could never hold us back from knowing God, knowing the love that God has for us, and from doing our purpose in this world. Because when God created humanity and earth and saw that it was good, God also gave us a purpose to be caretakers and stewards of the world and all that is good. We live into that and we pray, Jesus, that you would help us to live out that purpose, to be formers of community, 
to be stewards of resources and care of both our planet and our humanity. We pray, Jesus, that you would show us the way so that we may be healers and transformers just like you. Because, Jesus, you are good and holy, and so are we. Thank God. We pray all of this, and we would pray one thing more the way you, Jesus, taught us to pray together, boldly saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Lead Me, Guide Me. And it will be led and offered to us by our quartet and by Craig on the piano. And I invite us to sing this in spirit and on heart if we are in person in our meeting house. And of course, to uplift in body and song no matter where we are. Let us worship our God through this song now. Thank you. For those of you joining us in the meeting house, you may be seated at this time. I have a couple of brief announcements for you. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online and at home, I want to thank you for joining us during this time of worship. And a thank you to Stephen and Daniel and Bob for helping us bring this to your homes, both online and on WGCH um, 1490 AM. And we cannot do what we do without your support. Uh, to be the change we want to see in the world. We have to do it as a community. And there are three ways that you can support First Church through your financial offerings. Uh, you can donate, you can drop off a check at the church or leave one in one of our offering baskets on your way out. Or if you happen to text, you can text FCCOG donate to 73256. Or you can go to our website and securely donate online as well.
So we appreciate any and all support that you can give to us. And just a couple of uh, follow-up announcements, brief announcements. If you're watching at home and you'd like to join us in person, in person, or for those of you who joined us in person, you know the procedures of how to sign up. You can go to Eventbrite, and there's a link on our church website. You can sign up uh, for two weeks in advance for our worship services. So we'd love to see you in the meeting house if you feel comfortable and it feels safe to you to do so. So we'd love to see your glowing faces with your masks on in worship. And if not, please continue to worship with us at home online. We're happy to, do, to offer our worship in both ways to you. And our outreach committee, for a while we had our neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor shopping cart in the, in the um, what do we call that, the narthex, church words, in the narthex of the meeting house. I will have that out this week. I was on my list of things to do this week. It's not there today. But if you want to drop off food uh, donations for neighbor to neighbor, that will be in the meeting house every Sunday again, or you can drop it off during the, excuse me, during the week in the office. Um, that's it for my announcements. I invite you to go now with this blessing. Go in peace knowing that this home was created by God. And this home is good, and it is good to be human. And we, together, work alongside with the God who created us to make this world a better place, to make it good for all people. So may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God grant you everlasting peace. Amen. Go